Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome everyone to the 47th Hands on Agile uh, meetup. Um, today we have a very special guest. It's Itamar Gillard, um, who is uh, specializing in product management in general, you can say. He held senior product positions uh, and engineering roles for Google, Microsoft, and several startups at Google, for example, he was part of the team uh, that created Gmail and was head of Gmail's growth team. So today we will have a very special session because um, Itama will provide us with a tool, the confidence meter, that would help us to understand uh, when there when product discovery has been served, when enough has been done, and we probably should also think about uh, delivering something. Um, am I capturing that correctly, Itamo? Yeah, very well. Uh, just slight correction. I wasn't in the team that created Gmail. That would have been a, a huge achievement, but uh, that happened many years ah, before okay, me. okay. But I was in Gmail. Uh, I did some projects. If you use Gmail, some of the things you use may I may have had something to do with. Awesome. Okay, please, Itama, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for uh, for having me here. It's wonderful to be with you guys. So today I want to talk with you about product development in general, not just product management. And I argue that we have tremendous challenges, and especially the fact that there are so many unknowns uh, when it comes to what to develop, what to choose, kind of the core problem that we're all trying to address. What are the best ideas? And I think there's, in 25 years that I've been doing this, I found only one real tool, one real uh, thing that helps us navigate the uncertainty, and that's evidence. So I'm going to explain to you about the confidence meter that is a tool that kind of helps us guide ourselves towards where the evidence is pointing. To make this a little bit uh, more tangible, I'm going to use throughout this presentation a real-world example. And here it is. And I want you guys to play the role of the product person, the product manager, the product, whatever you want to call it, the person that decides what we should build. And here is the scenario. So imagine you're working in a company that develops some sort of communication platform for small business owners to talk with their own clients to answer their questions, to send them the today's menu, to send them invoices, et cetera, et cetera. We are observing the retention, the churn, et cetera, and it seems not so good. It looks like our growth is flattening. A lot of people are actually leaving us, a lot of customers. When we interview them, when we talk with them, we understand there's not enough value in the platform to keep them from going back to WhatsApp and email and all these other tools that they're using by default. So we're looking for some solutions, some ways to raise the level of value and to reduce the churn in our product, right? That's kind of the, the general scheme of things. And there are two ideas on the table, two big bets that we may make. One is the dashboard. The dashboard is an idea to show them statistics and analytics about the communication between them and the clients, what questions are being asked, who is the most persistent client? How long does it take to answer on average? You like this idea as the product manager. Uh, you talk to some customers and a handful, maybe three said, yeah, I'm interested in that. But your colleagues are not so excited. They say, you know, dashboards are for power users, for people with a lot of traffic. Our customers are not like that. No one actually in the company believes in this idea. Next, we will look at the chatbot. The chatbot is a much more appealing or sexy idea. It's basically to develop a chatbot that will automate some of the repetitive communication. If someone asks what are the opening times of the business, the chatbot might answer. The chatbot might alleviate some of the work that this business owner might have to do automatically. Now, this is an idea that you think is good. Your team just are aching to build this machine learning model, you know, to build this, the chatbot. Everyone's excited about this. Managers love this. This sounds exactly like the big bet we need to make. They're stopping you in the hallway and asking, when are we launching the chatbot? That's basically the discussion. All right. That's the background story just in general. So we can do a little kind of poll, if you like, uh, or, or vote. So I'm giving you three options, all right? 
Option number one is to go ahead and build a dashboard. Who is it in favor of option one? Use the voting in your Zoom right now. Show of hands. Who thinks the dashboard is the, the right uh, solution here? And you see the other two options. Option two is the chatbot. Option three is to say, I'm not sure. So let's count who's in favor of the dashboard. No one is in favor of the dashboard. All right. Who's in favor of the chatbot? Who thinks we should build a chatbot? No one. Who's not sure? Who's going to say, I'm not completely, oh, all right. This is a very uncertain group of people. Everyone's unsure. All right. You can put your hands down. Thank you very much. So you guys are saying you're unsure. And I actually agree with you. That's the right answer here. Because in all this story I told you, there was only one bit of evidence. Everything else was opinion. Anyone notice what the bit of evidence was? It's the fact that three customers said I might be interested in that. That's the only uh, element of evidence. And that's very weak evidence because, of course, we know customers are not good at predicting their future behavior. However, I will tell you that as a very experienced product manager, for, for most of my career, I would have chosen the chatbot because it's just much harder to go against the consensus, against your leaders and your team. But let's say, like me, you got burned with this approach in the past, and this time you, you try to be a little bit more scientific. So I'm going to offer you an alternative way to attack this problem. So... I'm going to suggest using ice cores. You may be familiar with them. If not, I will explain briefly. So for every idea you collect, you can kind of assign to it three attributes, impact, confidence, and ease. I will explain each one of those, but in general, they're in the range of zero to 10. And if you want, and it's optional, and I don't think it's necessary always to do this, you can also multiply the number and come up with an ice score. So that's how it works. The second part is that we're going to do build measure learns. And I call this steps. It's a kind of a combination of delivery and discovery. So once we, we have an idea in our hand that we like, instead of building the whole thing and then discovering at the end whether or not it was actually a good idea, we do this. We start and we build very cheap things that teach us something. And then we, we learn and we pivot the idea. That's what I did with showing the, the direction of the errors changes. We build something else that teaches us a bit more and gradually we build more and more of the idea, but we also build more learning. We progress on both fronts at the same time. It's what Eric Chris used to call build, merge, or learn, or we're still calling it. What I suggest doing is that when we end each one of these mini projects and we learn something, we recalculate the ice score. And I'm going to do this with you guys. Each one of those I call steps. They're, I don't like the word experiments because I think everything is actually an experiment. I call them steps, all right? So bear with me. Step number one is just to calculate the ice cores of both ideas just without collecting any new information, without uh, actually digging and doing any research. Let's dig a little bit deeper into what impact and ease are. I'm not going according to the order of ice, but bear with me. Impact tries to answer the question, if this idea is successful, reasonable best case scenario, how much will it positively impact the key metric? In this case, the key metric is churn. We're trying to reduce churn. So how much can we improve all? The opposite is retention. How much can we improve the retention of our customers if uh, this idea is successful? Chatbot or the dashboard? And you can do some sort of t-shirt sizing saying high impact is this, low impact is, is another. I like to actually break it into 10 different levels of impact. So if something says creates a 15 to 20% improvement in my metric, I'll give it a nine. That's a huge improvement. That's really high impact. If it's between 0 0.5 and one, it's a two, it's low impact. All right. And that's just what's possible in my organization or in my product in this metric. In your case, you should adjust the, the scale completely or, or use t-shirt sizes again. Is, you guys know what it is. It's like the opposite of effort. It's how easy or hard is it to implement the idea. And here we can count it in person weeks. So if something it takes between one and two person weeks, super easy, I'll give it to nine. Between 70 and 25 weeks, very hard, it's a two. Why? Because that's our velocity. That's how my team measures what's easy and what's hard. Again, we should adjust. All right, so just... With this in mind, 
the product manager, all the product manager plus the engineering lead plus the designer, what the team leads can sit together and evaluate the idea. And just off the top of our mind, after a very short analysis, we say, all right, dashboard might help improve the retention or reduce the churn of a subset of our users that have the traffic and are technical enough to use the dashboard. So we estimate it's a four based on our mapping table. The ease is a four to it. It's not super hard, but it's also not super easy. We estimate it's a four. Chatbot, much higher impact, going to impact a lot of users in a positive way. It might be a real reason for them to stay with us, but not easy to implement. We give it a two, right? These are guesses, absolute guesses. Now comes the last element and the star of the presentation, which is confidence. Confidence tries to ask the question, how sure are we that the idea will have the estimate impact and under that with this amount of ease. And the only way to answer this question actually is to, to look at what evidence do we have in support of this impact assessment. And to answer this question, I created this colorful tool, which I call the confidence meter. It basically works a bit like a thermometer. Imagine the, there's a needle there or, or a, ga a gauge. It goes from the blue area, which was very low confidence, all the way up to, to the red area, which is full confidence. Notice that the numbers go from zero to 10, so it exactly fits with the high score model. The blue area is all about opinion. To see their self-conviction, you think it's a good idea, you manage to create a very shiny pitch deck to explain why it's a great idea. These are very low forms of confidence, obviously. So you get 0.01 or 0.03 respectively for this. You manage to connect the idea to some higher theme. You know, it's the metaverse or it's about blockchain, web three, or that really doesn't give you a lot of points either because a lot of really terrible ideas are being implemented, connected to these things or to the company strategy, etc. So. These are opinions on a large scale. Light blue area is a little bit more kind of challenging. You present your idea to other people in the company, to experts, to stakeholders, and they say it's a good idea. That's what I call others' opinions. Sometimes you do this through structural reviews. That's a harder test because these people might find flaws in your idea you didn't think of. So if you succeed, I give you a 0 0.1. Why? Because these people also don't have a crystal ball. They don't see the future. They're not the customers. They're giving you their best opinion. So it's still pretty low confidence. Estimates and plans. You do some analysis on paper, as some business model. We will do an example of this maybe later on. That sometimes is enough to kill an idea. You see that already on paper, it doesn't make sense. So you can park it there. Going into this kind of pinkish uh, violet area, this is about starting to collect data. Initially, you find anecdotal data, anecdotal evidence. This could be a few product data points you find in the logs or in your statistics. One to three customers express interest, etc. So it's already starting to be meaningful because it's data from the outside. It's not just opinions, but it's anecdotal. And a few data points can create an image in our mind, but it might be just a mirage. Market data is about collecting a lot more data through surveys, through smoke tests, through deep competitive analysis and other methods. Still data, not really tests. And then in the red area, we're moving into actual testing and there's various forms of tests that actually generate stronger and stronger evidence. Full confidence, 100% sure that it's a good idea, only after you launch. You need to monitor it for a few months and then you can give yourself a little badge. I had a good idea, right? So that's how the tool works. Let's put it to use. It's nice to look at the graphic, but I also turned it into a spreadsheet format, which you guys can actually download from my website. You have here the URL at the top and also a little QR code. And it basically is a spreadsheet. I'm not very sophisticated with, you know, no code application. It's a spreadsheet. The way you use it here, you see on the left, these are all the categories of evidence I just mentioned. Each one with its relative weight. And notice that the scale is logarithmic. So if you are succeeding in a hard test, that's about a thousand times stronger than your own opinion. That's the way the tool works. You need to go into this column indicators and put a one or a two or a 0 0.5 here based on what you find. So for example, 
If you have self-conviction, put area one, if you think it's a good idea. If you found thematic support, let's uh, say it aligns with the vision and strategy of the company and it aligns with some th big buzzword in the market, you can put a two here. It doesn't really matter because even if you found a thousand indicators, the maximum you can get for this type of category of evidence is 0 0.1. All right, enough technical stuff. Let's go on with the story. So back to our ice analysis, what confidence should we have in the dashboard? So self-conviction, you think it's a good idea, or at least I'm forcing you to think that. Pitch deck, you haven't done it. So no confidence boost. Thematic support, there's no theme around dashboards, so unfortunately nothing. Other people's opinion, you did review this with your team and your managers, and they all said no. So you can't actually give yourself a boost based on that saying, yeah, it is impactful and is for based on this analysis. Estimate and plan you haven't done. However, when you talk to customers, one to three interested customers said this would be useful for them. So that gives you anecdotal evidence. 0 0.6, the tool sums up the number and you can plug it in here, 0 0.61. And if you want, you can multiply the numbers and that gives you a 9.8 total I score. Let's do the same thing for the chatbot. So the chatbot has a lot more going for it. You think it's a good idea. You haven't done the pitch deck, but at least when I did this example the first time, a few years ago, chatbots were actually in fashion. That was like a theme around them. Facebook, before it was called Meta, had a big project for, uh, you know, kind of chatbots. A lot of companies invested in chatbots. This phase has kind of faded out, and now I wouldn't know if you can actually give it a thematic support boost, but let's say it's a yes. And others' opinion, absolutely, everyone in the company loves it, so you can give it to one. You could even put here a two because it's different groups of people that say yes. However, the total number we come up with is 0 0.16, which is much lower than the boost point from the confidence that we had for the dashboard. And why is that? because it's based on opinions of people on the inside of the company, while well, the opinions that really matter of all the people outside the company. That's just how the tool works, surprisingly. So we have 9.8 versus 2.6. What do you guys think that means? What should we do next? Should we now launch the dashboard? Should we now kill the chatbot? The answer is no, because if you look, I also added these labels to the tool. And the chatbot is in this area. 0 0.66 is very low confidence. And the dashboard is in the low confidence area. Which just means you can't really launch one of these kind of big meaty ideas based on the evidence you have. You just don't know enough. In this area, like the low, the only thing I would launch is basically a minor design change. We're tweaking the order of the settings in the settings page. Most people don't visit or we're changing the font. That's the level of confidence we need. Like you do a review with your peers, it's good enough, let's launch it. It's not working, we can unlaunch it, the risk is not high. But things like the chatbot or the dashboard, we need to push much higher before we stop testing, right? So the numbers don't really matter that much, or the ratio, the fact that one is almost four times the other doesn't really matter any. We need to keep testing. So let's go to step number two, and that's assessment. You're just willing to go and spend a little bit more time assessing the idea on a deeper level. So let's say you as a product person are taking the ideas, both ideas, and try to create some model, some fun analysis. You ask yourself how many people will be exposed to this, how many will try it, how many will it retain, stuff like that. You make a series of smaller guesses and you come to the conclusion that the chatbot is indeed an eight, but on paper, the dashboard is even less impactful. So it's a three. At the same time, your colleagues, your engineering colleagues go out and try to break the project into its parts and to assess ease. And they come all smiling and say, guess what? The dashboard with the machine learning and everything is actually going to be easier than you think. Now, a lot of you guys are engineers, so I'm going to say this with caution. As an experienced product manager, when I hear this message, warning light bulbs light up in my head just because I've been told this exact thing so many times and it always turned out to be not true. 
but let's say it's, I mean, not let's say it's, we have to trust the assessment. So we're putting a three there instead of a two. And now what happened to confidence? We're getting a boost here in this category called estimates and plans, back of devil calculation, angel UX feasibility, evaluation, project timeline, etc. So both get a one, looks like it's a three and an eight with this ease. So the numbers now are, so we got a little boost here and the numbers now are 11 versus 10.9. They're neck and neck. And let's not kid ourselves, this decimal point means nothing. So basically the tool cannot tell them about one idea is more impactful, but harder to do. The other is, is the opposite. So keep going. Let's keep testing a little bit more. Next step is to launch a survey. So we sent to a few hundreds of our customers a question, which of the following features will most help you in your work? We need to be very cautious when we ask a question like this, because people are really bad at predicting their future behavior. What we're actually trying to ask here is, do they have the need that this thing is expressing? So we're trying to express the benefit that this thing will create for them and see if they resonate with at least the value proposition. So for the dashboard, we're seeing, seeing statistics and trends of how my clients engage with the service. And for the chatbot, we're saying this service that will automatically and intelligently respond to clients' common questions and requests. And we get answers very quickly, usually service are filled very quickly. And the chatbot comes up as the clear number one. The dashboard comes as number three, but it's a very close number three. And it may have been flipped if we had a larger survey or maybe a slightly different sample. So it's almost a number two. What does that mean? So it doesn't change anything about impact or ease in our mind in both ideas, but now the chatbot definitely gets a boost here in market data. So supported by surveys, you see it here. So it gets another one out of 10, which is pretty low still because surveys are not very strong, but it brings the our confidence level to 146 out of 10. And the dashboard at the same time, we're giving it just 0.5 boost here. By the way, I'm sorry if the font is very small and it's hard to read. And I know it's not sexy to present a spreadsheet, but that's the sort of person I am. So why just 0.5? Because the survey is kind of supporting the idea that this is a impact three and is a four, but because it came number three and not number two, and it was so close, we're unsure. When you're unsure, you can either reduce impact or reduce the confidence. And that's what the team chose to do here. So now if we look at the high scores, the chatbot has moved into the lead, right? And that's interesting. So maybe that's the idea we should choose. So I'm going to ask you guys again for a vote. Let's show of hand. We've made quite a bit of a road. Surely your opinion has formed. A show of hands, who thinks we should launch the dashboard? I think I see one, but I'm not sure. Oh, I'm seeing, is there a way to actually count these things? I don't know. I'm not a Zoom expert. All right. These guys, please put down your hand. Who thinks we should launch the chatbot? I think quite a few hands, a lot more than before. We're sure. All right. Fantastic. Thank you guys. Please put down your hand. Who is still not sure? Mm. There are quite a few not sure people there. Not sure who was the winner here, the not sure or I think more people are convinced about the chatbot. By the way, I joke around on, on product managers when they say this, is it actually possible for a product manager to say the words, I'm not sure. And, uh, for product managers, this is a funny joke. Anyway, so I think the answer is still not sure here because surveys are such a weak form of evidence. It's definitely stronger than what we had before, but it still puts us in this medium low category that is strictly not enough to launch such an idea. Why is this? Because people may misunderstand the question in the survey or be bad at projecting the real answer once they're faced with the feature or may for some reason not give us the real answer or may bias the survey by the way we ask the question or whom we sent the survey. So surveys are very kind of medium low confidence, I would say, trending to, towards the low. So I would, in this case, 
either choose one idea and keep testing it, which is legitimate, or in this case, the team decides to keep testing both. So step number four is a usability test. We invite 12 existing customers into our lab and we show them, oh, well, we do this online, there's many ways, and we show them kind of live prototypes or prototypes of both ideas, convincing user interface. But of course, we don't really build it. What happens there is we use can data for the dashboard and to simulate the chatbot, we have a person behind the scenes actually emulating the chatbot. That's what's often called a Wizard of Oz test. And the results are very interesting. And of course, before we run the test, we interview them about the needs. Do they have the needs that the chatbot and the dashboards are trying to address? So we use this opportunity to do also qualitative research. And the results are very interesting. So it turns out a lot more people than we think actually need what the dashboard is trying to give. And when they see the dashboard, a lot more people than we expect, even people who are not getting that much traffic or not so far user ratio are saying, you know what, this is really useful. I'm often bothered by this question that this thing is answering. I could actually use this if you gave it to me. So that really surprises us in a positive way and enables us to boost the impact to a six from a previous three. Just shows that our estimation was wrong. Nothing changes about the ease of the dashboard because of chatbot. On the other hand, everyone loves it. In principle, everyone gets super excited with the idea, with the value proposition. They all want it. When they use it, they're all getting excited and they all want it today, tomorrow. However, we are seeing some issues. Usability is a challenge. They need to train the chatbot. They need to understand how to do the handovers. And for non-technical people, this is not as simple as we've thought. Also, some of the assumptions that we have that there's a lot of repetitive information is not true. They, they keep changing the opening ties. They keep changing the daily menu. So maybe the chatbot is not going to be as useful as we thought. Plus, they're raising some risks. They're saying, you know, my customers know me and they expect a very personal touch. It's a small business. So I'm afraid that the dashboard will sound too robotic and insult my customers. This gives us a lot of stuff to mull and to think about. It sounds like it's potentially very high, so we actually boost the impact to nine, but it sounds like there's some risks there. And what we do is we lower the ease because we understand building a usable version of this is going to be hard. And in terms of confidence, we give a full boost of confidence to the dashboard because really the results are very clearly in favor of the six and four. However, for the chatbot, because we see risks, we are only giving it a 0.5 this time. The evidence is not super conclusive that it's really a nine. It's just hot. And based on that, now the numbers are flipped again, 81 versus 44. And now again, we need to stop and ask ourselves, what shall we do? And obviously the next step, if we do it, is going to be much more expensive. So if we can afford only one at a time, which one would you choose? The tool, in this case, we reach kind of a medium level confidence, 3.4. It's pretty reliable to choose the dashboard right now as the one to invest in. Doesn't mean we need to kill the chatbot, but if we had to choose one, I would choose the dashboard just based on the evidence. However, to make the story a little bit more interesting, the team decides to test both in the next step. And that next step is an MVP slash longitudinal test. Um, it's a terrible name. Let me explain. So basically we build a version of this that is functional, but has only the core value, the core functionality. It's not very polished. It doesn't cover all the scenarios. It's not scalable. It's only meant for one purpose, to be given to users to use for two weeks unattended. So we pick a few hundred users that said in the survey, I'm really interested in the chatbot, a few hundred users that said, I'm really interested in the dashboard. We ask them, are you interested to actually test this thing? 200 of each say, yes, I'm interested. Or we pick 200 of those that say yes. And to those, we give the MVP versions to use. We explain to them how to use them and we start monitoring them remotely. So we can see how much or how little they use it. It's kind of a way to simulate retention before you actually launch. 
I learned this technique in Google from some very talented user researchers. With the dashboard, out of the 200, it says, yeah, we'll use it. Only 160 started using it in practice. But then the retention was pretty good. By the end of the two weeks, we ended up with around 130 people still using it. And we surveyed them throughout the two weeks. We sent them surveys to ask them to rate their satisfaction and also to give us qualitative feedback. We see that the satisfaction is actually growing the more they use it. They really love this thing. And they're actually building workflows around it. They're finding a lot of value in it. And those people, when we take away the, the feature from them at the end of the two weeks, are gravely disappointed. This is as good a result as you can imagine for this test. This is really flying colors, really good result. Chatbot, on the other hand, similar number of people started using it, but then we see a sharp decline. A lot of people are not trying it ever again. At the end of the test, we get 25 users. Those people are kind of okay with it, kind of happy with it but they are special. The other ones are kind of telling us, you know, it's not doing what I expected. It's making me work harder. It's annoying people. I don't understand this thing. They're not loving it. And it could be that it's our test that is causing this we, because we send them an MVP. It's not complete. It's not final. But we realize that even if we build the full thing, it's probably going to miss the mark for a lot of these people. It's not really what they need. It's not as useful as we thought it would be. Uh, so here's how the numbers change now. The dashboard, we're boosting it to an eight. This result was so good that we feel that the impact is really high. And now because we already built this MVP version, we're closer to completion. So it's a five instead of a four. So the ease improved a little bit. Chatbot, we're removing, the, reducing the impact to 0 0.5 because the way we understand this idea today is only going to be helpful for a small subset of users. And the ease we're, we're lowering it yet further because we understand it's going to be very hard for us to build it. And now we can give both ideas a boost here in the final category test results. It's a really, it's a really strong form of evidence. And now we have strong conviction about these numbers. So this. 244 and, and 2.7 are very indicative of what we think will happen in reality. Now the choice is pretty clear. Unless you are working with an extremely hard case executive that will still argue with this result and say, guys, I still think we should launch the chatbot. This will probably convince everyone in the company which idea we should finish and launch, right? Just before I go into your questions, let's look at what happened here from a kind of ice core perspective. So we did five steps, which is optional. Obviously, you don't have to go through these five steps or even through five steps with most ideas. With small ideas, low risk ideas, you can do one and then launch them if it still looks good. With large ideas that affect all of your users and take months or years to build, you may need a lot more. In Gmail, we definitely did more for the big things. And it doesn't have to be just these five. There are many other forms of tests. Just for this story, I ran both ideas through the same five, but usually for each idea we test in different ways because they have different assumptions to validate. What you see here in the lines are the ice cores. So the blue line is the dashboard and the red line is the chatbot. You can see that for most of the time, the ice cores weren't that meaningful. What mattered was the confidence level, whether or not we're sure that it's enough to launch or not. It only starts being important here because now we have stronger confidence about these ice cores and you can see how they diverge. The dashboard turned out into a big win. This doesn't happen a lot. It's really rare to find an idea like that. And actually there are statistics that most ideas are like the chatbot. They actually generate no value at all or very little or sometimes negative value. There's a lot of research uh, the data scientists have done on this. So what we want to do is run through more and more ideas and to filter out the bad ones. And usually you can do this much earlier. You don't have to go through five steps to know. Usually in the early steps, you already can park them in order to improve our chances of finding the blue lights, the good ideas, which are rare. And once you have one, you should keep investing in it. So that's the system. This is part of a broader system that I'm calling GIST, Goals, Ideas, Steps, and Tasks. What I just described to you is basically the steps layer. 
this is how it works, but there's some theory about goals and some ideas and the task layer is how to connect this with agile, by the way, which maybe is interesting for you guys too. I'm working on, on a book. Don't know when this will come, but there's a lot of resources that you guys can download before that. Don't wait for the book. If you go to my site, itamogilites slash resources, there's a ton of stuff you can download from there, including the confidence meter and other stuff. And if you sign up to my newsletter, you're, you're welcome to get all the new stuff for free. Articles, new tools, new templates, etc. That was it for me. Shall we do questions? Thank you so much. We indeed have a few questions. And by the way, I can highly recommend Itamar's newsletter. Uh, sign up and uh, be surprised and enjoy uh, what he's sharing. It's uh, massively helpful. So we have a few questions here. The first one, does this methodology uh, apply to creating complex ISV software solutions, B2B solutions, not B2C? residing within an enterprise level ERP system? Well, it, it really varies. I mean, if you are in a B2B company and you're developing a product that you intend to sell to multiple customers in the market again and again, I would say yes. The, the rate of iteration is much slower usually because you can't really do a lot of these things with large enterprise customers, but there are other tests, qualitative test work, interviews, Sometimes you can survey them, you can look at data, collect data about their usage. You can do early adopter programs, very useful. You can do advisory boards. There's all sorts of ways to test with B2B. If you're in the business of custom solutions, you create one-offs for different customers. I don't think this is the tool necessarily because it's meant to just basically iterate and discover what the market wants, not just the one customer. The next question, what do we track discovery development practices have you found helpful in creating focus with your product teams? So you, you're making an assumption that I'm a supporter of dual track. For those not familiar, I assure you guys are familiar, but dual track is, we have two types of iterations or sprints, one's our discovery and the others are delivery. So what I described to you could fall into this. Format were the early stages, the early steps, up to the point where we're convinced we have high confidence this is a good idea. That was discovery, and after that, we will go into delivery. But if you talk with, with Malty Kagan, for example, kind of is one of the proponents of discovery, what he thinks of discovery is very early stages where you do some research very quickly, and then after that. So that's for him, is dual track. Where I slightly differ is I think even in these stages where you're discovering, you're also building. And even in the stages where you're delivering, you're still discovering. So I think it, the two are kind of intermixed. And I honestly encourage the teams to think of them as discoverers all the time, as researchers, as people that are not just building code or de delivering code or designs, but actually discovering what the market wants in collaboration with the product manager, the researchers, etc. So all the sprints in my mind are kind of a mix of delivery and discovery. Next one. In a project-minded company that struggles to shift into evidence-based product thinking mindset, where would or have you introduced this way of working? ICE plus confidence radar. All right, that's a great question. So if the company is very project focused. It's all about output. Let's build this project or that project. These ideas, they, usually the ideas that the people with power are, are with better. And we're just in this cycle of chasing the big ideas. We never have time to actually discover anything because we're rushing with output. So what I discovered is that sometimes looking back at the roadmap from last year, all the things we kind of planned of course, the plan and the reality is different. All the things we delivered, we succeeded to launch. How many of them actually created impact or the outcomes we expect? Almost no company knows this, the answer to this question. What's the rate of success, actually? How many of the things? If you do this analysis and you are able to translate it into euros or dollars and you show it to them and you say, look, every quarter 
we're burning through a ton of cash because we're putting our most expensive resources building stuff that doesn't matter. Do it carefully. Don't insult anyone, of course. But that's a message they understand. And that kind of gives you the opening to say, you know, there's a different way. There's various ideas how we can do this. And you need to carve out some sort of sandbox where they allow you to actually try out the new way. If you're interested for them to hear this from a, a guy with a strange accent, I'm happy to come in and talk to these people too. I've been known to, to have these discussions with them. It's also important to find a champion because usually inside the executive team, there is someone who is aware that what you're saying is true. The CTO usually or the CPO. And these could be your allies in kind of trying to push the organization. Having said that, it's a really hard challenge and a lot of companies are struggling with it. Next question. After each step, there were changes in impact ease. How do you estimate them? The whole team or just the product manager? How do you justify it? All right. So estimating impact is really an art form, I would say. It's a guess, but it's, it has to be a slightly educated guess. It gets easier and easier the more advanced you go through the steps, right? In the latest steps, people were telling us what they think. So at that stage, estimating impact becomes easier. The early stages, it's kind of a fancy guesswork. I argue that the best person usually to do this is the product manager, or you might call him or her the product owner. So they're responsible for high scoring ideas. Sometimes they will do this with the other leads of the team, but I found it's a huge waste of time doing it with the entire team. It's really the engineers, the designer, they don't want to sit through this arduous uh, high scoring sessions, but it is important to do what I call idea hygiene. Just like you clear up your back backlog or you're supposed to, you're supposed to do this with ideas. As ideas come, as people ask you for stuff, you should do the high score, make a decision. Doesn't look like it's going to contribute to our goals right now. We're going to park it or put it into some track where you're you're planning to actually work on it, but don't let the ideas just hang out there and, and collect because then you'll have that, this huge, huge idea bank that no one can use. Okay. Next one. How do you value data from large studies about the exact topic? Uh, for example, uh, if there was a study about demand for chat box in X sector. I think it's there in thematic support. If you look, there's like a, a Gartner report that says in five years from now, a trillion dollars will be invested in this and the emerging markets it will grow by 500%. Studies are good, but they're looking at general data that it's very unlikely that the people they've studied on are exactly your target market, exactly correct for your context. So they don't give you a lot of confidence. They just kind of give you this thematic support. There is a theme, there is maybe a need based on this research. I wouldn't build any major feature and launch it just based on this sort of evidence. It's just a little bit contributing to our confidence, but not by much. Next one. When a company has less capacity for MVPs or A-B testing, which elements of the process do you see as irreplaceable for large features? It really depends why. Is it because you don't have the infrastructure to measure or is it because you, you don't have the people to, to build? If you don't have the people to build, you definitely don't have the people to build full features and then discover if it's, uh, if it's working or not. But the fallback is always qualitative. You can start by talking to people. That's usually where startups start. The first advice any startup founder hears is go and talk to your customers. Go and observe them. Go and learn this way. And then later on, if when you start building a slightly larger user base, you can start serving them or occasionally asking them to participate in some uh, experiments or tests. Only when you get to larger sets, you can have A-B experiments, etc. And I think it's really important to build up your experimentation capability as along the, the lines of building out your product. If you don't do the two together, it's like infrastructure, like you launch infrastructure, etc. You need to also build this capability in order to be an evidence guided company. We managed the QA section. That's it. 
So, Itamar, thanks a lot uh, for the exciting news. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the book. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be awesome. And um, yeah, I hope the rest of you had a good idea about the confidence meter and how to use this in, in practice when uh, product discovery gets, gets serious <laughs> and you have to make investment decisions. I know this uh, problem deciding what to build very well, so sometimes you just go for the thing that sounds a bit more sexy, you know? a bit more stimulating. You yeah, know, the latest uh, thing that is fashionable. And then, lo and behold, you figure out it's actually not the one that you want to build. So, Itamar, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.